Frank Seppi from Muscle and Fitness. We are here for the National Military Fitness and Wellness Month. I'm here with Senior Military Editor Robert Wilkins. Hey, Rob, who's our guest thanks. tonight? <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, Frank. We appreciate it. <laughs> our honor today to have a, what is he? He's an American hero. He's a football player. He's a movie star. He's all of that, but he's real. He's a serviceman, first and foremost. He's a proud American. So, Nate Boyer is our guest today. Nate, thanks for taking the time. I know you're catching planes. We catch you in between all these flights. And so we appreciate you making a little time for us today. Of course. Now I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really, excited to have, really excited to have you. Uh, we always want to start first with your military background and how you got started in the uh, military. Yeah, so I, I joined um, not right after 9-11. 9-11 is kind of what got me thinking about it. Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area. Not a lot of people joined the military from where I grew up, like that immediate area. I kind of grew up in El Cerrito, eventually moved further East Bay. Um, so after high school, I went down to San Diego, worked on a fishing boat, kind of did some odd jobs. Uh, eventually moved up to Los Angeles because I was interested in, in film and TV back then at, at 19. Um, when I was 20 years old, 9-11 happened. And like I said, didn't join right away, but kind of started thinking about it, thinking about what was my place in the world um, and started uh, backpacking here and there and then ended up doing some relief work out in the, in the, the Darfur. It's a region right between Sudan and Chad in Africa. And I volunteered for about 60 days completely changed my life, my perspective. Um, the last week there, I actually got malaria and this family put me up and take, took care of me. And uh, they put this little radio by the cot that I was sleeping on. And I, on the radio, I, I listened to uh, the second battle of Fallujah. The, the BBC network was out there covering it. And, um, and I was just li listening to these, you know, Marines that were, um, that were over there fighting for those that can't fight for themselves. And after what little time I spent uh, in, in uh, the Darfur, I was like, man, I want to, I want to keep serving at some level. I want to help people like this. I deserve a chance. And so I came back to the States, um, found out about what the army special forces did. The motto de oppresso libera, which means to free the oppressed really spoke to me. And so I just kind of made up my mind. I wanted to be a green beret. And so I, uh, I enlisted and, you know, few months later off to basic training I went well it's a little bit harder than just wanting to be a green beret there's lots of qualifications <laughs> yeah true. lots of uh, sacrifices <laughs> lots of strain and struggle so again being humble about that but go um, big or go home <laughs> right and Nate did uh you come from a military family did your grandfather your father your mom or someone in your family served prior to your service both my grandfathers uh, were, were in World War II so one of them was a navigator in the Army Air Corps, and the other one was a, I believe, a machinist in the Navy oh, wow. um, on a submarine. So they had both served, um, but honestly, I didn't know a ton about it. We hadn't talked about it that much, right. and uh, and that was really it. You know, my cousin went to Air Force Academy. He's actually my younger cousin. Um, so we kind of went about the same time. I think when he was in the Air Force Academy is when I enlisted. So besides that, not really in my family. Um, so it wasn't something that I was genuinely thinking about, at least taking seriously thinking about, I should say, right. uh, growing up um, until, you know, we were at, we were at war it, and it definitely changed the way I thought about, well, joining the military in the first place, but the importance of it, I think, as a lot of us do that aren't around it, if you don't have, you know, immediate family or mm -hmm. close friends, people in your community that serve, you often don't quite relate to it and so not that I was ungrateful but I just def definitely didn't have that perspective and understand how important it was that people were willing to volunteer to go do that you know um, not only the fact that they're you're potentially sacrificing your life um, but that you're you're dedicating at least a portion of your life to service to country and um you know, there's a lot that goes with it. It's <laughs> some of your own personal freedoms you sort of have to sacrifice for a while, you know, so you can provide them for other people. And uh, and so the, all those things came a little bit more clear, uh, you know, as I as I got older, as a lot of things do as we age. Um, and also, I just didn't uh, at that time in my life, I didn't feel purposeful. I didn't have a lot going on. 
Um, I didn't feel like what I did day to day made much of a difference in anybody's life. And, you know, I just, uh, I wanted to change that. I wanted to change that narrative within my, inside myself. And I wanted to be a part of something special. And so I just, I just did it. I said, you know what, this is, this is who I'm going to be now. And, uh, and so I enlisted and, and, you know, like you said, the training's not easy. I mean, it's two years, pretty much after basic training, airborne school, special forces mm -hmm. selection, the Q, the special forces qualification course. And eventually if you pass all that, you know, you earn your green beret and even to get a selection slot, it is tough. Like you have to score certain, you know, levels on psyche valve, language aptitude tests, the ASVAB tests, um, physical exams, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, and, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting because as you're going through the training, you don't really know what the standards are <laughs> they don't tell you, you know, like, oh, you have to just hit this number and, you know, you gotta, you gotta be able to, uh, ruck march, you know, a marathon and this time, like you, you don't know what it is. And, uh, you're out there doing land navigation and a lot of other stuff. Um, often independently, sometimes with a team and you just, all you can do is, is go as hard as you can for as long as you can, because you don't know if you're making time or, or what's around the corner. So, you know, better just go all in. How do you prepare? So you that prepare? day that, go ahead, Frank. No, I was just going to say, how do you prepare for that? Like one day a marathon, one day, it's like, you know, how do you, how do you mentally prepare for that? Some people can't uh, get off the couch to go to the gym. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, the only way to mentally prepare for it yeah. is to start putting the repetitions in. Like when you're not mentally, when you're not mentally prepared, you know what I mean? Just yeah. like forcing your body to just kind of go. So um, that's more discipline over ins inspiration or motivation. Because when you're inspired, you do it. When you're disciplined, right. you do it when you don't want to do it. Well, I think, yeah, I think I, I definitely didn't have discipline starting out though i think it started with inspiration because i i knew after my time in africa and learning about what the, the what they did in the special forces what the job required you know there's a humanitarian element to the work that we're doing we're doing this foreign internal defense where everything we do is by with and through afghan and iraqi forces if we're going to afghanistan and iraq so not only are you um training them uh, but you're often fighting alongside them, living with them, and they become your brothers in arms as well. And I just, that really spoke to me and it felt unique um, to what motivated me because I wanted, I just wanted to, I wanted to work alongside, you know, the indigenous people of wherever we were. That was important to me. Um, and so I think because I was inspired to be a part of that unit specifically, that's what got me up and, you know, got me got me out the door and got the rucksack on my back every day and like didn't really quitting wasn't an option because of because if I quit I'd still I'd still you know being be in the military I'd still be in the army I'd still go to a great unit but I would always know that I you know I'd have that regret of sort of just giving up if I got hurt or I didn't make the standards but I did everything I could and, and put the effort in I can live with that. You know what I mean? Um, but eventually I started to develop the discipline and develop more of the endurance because it just like anything, I mean, you know, Frank, you didn't, you didn't start to start with those big, those big biceps, man. You got to work on those bad boys. Uh, we, you know? we and they don't just, they don't just, they're not just there. And and then you got to tear, you got to tear the muscles so they can repair and grow. And, you know, it's the same thing with, with just mental endurance too. You got to like kind of work past your breaking point every day. And eventually your breaking point gets a little bit further away um, yeah. until I had two, I had two you genuinely brothers. feel like it doesn't exist. You know, I had two nasty big brothers, but when I worked out, they'd be like, what are you, what are you carrying those strings around? Oh, those are your arms. So, so mentally I was beaten down. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Nate, once you became a Green Beret that day, that had to be a special day to you in your career. Like that has to be a date of highlights of you can't believe that of all the things when all the times you thought you weren't going to make it, when all the other people around you, you saw some of them dropping out. Once that day happens and you know, you see the person to the left or to the right of you getting sworn in, you know, you're next. What are your emotions? What are you feeling 
as you know, you're about to become the next, uh, first I was gonna say America's next top model, but I mean the actual, <laughs> the next Green Beret, the next special forces legend, you know, um, that has to be a really special feeling. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I mean, you kind of dream about it when you start training for it. You know, you're, you're always looking forward to that day and it, it, it feels like it's forever away, especially when you're wandering around the um, sand hills of North Carolina and, you know, in, in February and it's freezing and you're, you know, you're just, your body's broken and you feel like you can't take another step. Yeah, you know, it feels that that feels it feels almost unattainable, but you know it's there. And so you just take that, you just take that step and you take another one. And that's kind of what motivates you through it. Um, the hopes of you know getting to don the the green beret at one point. And and I, I definitely remember our uh it wasn't our formal graduation ceremony, it was our inform informal one um out at Camp McCall. And you know, we finished selection and a lot of people had already dropped out or quit or got hurt, you know, so there wasn't a ton, there wasn't like the full class left, but of the people that were left, even then, not everybody gets selected. And that's kind of a tough thing. You're definitely nervous going into that. And they sort of separate people by roster numbers and kind of put us in these different areas. So like you're looking around and, and I remember looking around and seeing some people that I thought there's no way this guy is not going to, this guy, you know, there's no way that this guy didn't get selected. Um, so I felt pretty confident, but you still just don't know. And maybe they're going to split us up again. Like, I don't know. We're standing there in formation. And then, uh, some former, uh, SF guys that are, you know, civilian clothes, older cats kind of walking around there. Some of them Vietnam era, uh, sort of the, the, the goats, man, the OG green berets. And this, I just remember this guy walks up behind me, puts his hand on my shoulder and kind of leans into my ear and is like, he just whispered, well, welcome to the brotherhood, you know, <laughs> and I got, got chills. Because, yeah, I was going to say, I got but, chills too. Like, <laughs> yeah, at that moment, I was like, you know, I was trying not to smile on my big old cheesy grin because um, you're, you're, I mean, you're in formation, you're supposed to be all professional, you know, but it was exciting. I was about to freaking burst. I think you're muted. So after you, after you um graduated, what was the next step for you? Did you have an assignment? Did you have a mission that you're already assigned to? Did you know where you were going or how did that next process work? Yeah, I went, so I went to 1st Battalion, 1st Special Forces Group in Okinawa initially. And since I was a commo guy, uh, Special Forces Communication Sergeant, you know, there's there's different jobs essentially in within the Special Forces. You, you, you Everybody learns different skills, right? Um, a, a different like MOS. So, the, the Bravos were weapons guys. The Charlies were uh, engineers slash demolitions. Um, the Deltas were the medics. And I was an echo, which is communications. Um, so you're, you know, you're learning mostly like satellite communications, satcom radios are what you're using overseas, but you use some line of sight stuff as well. So, you, you know, you, that's some of the things you're learning in the schoolhouse before. So I knew I was going to be an echo. And then I got Korean as my language because we all have to learn a language in the course. So... Wow. That meant I was going to go to first group because first group, Southeast Asia is their area of operation. Um, and that in a time of war, everybody is cycling in to go where that is, right? To go. So in this case, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but when I went out to Oki, uh, I was put, I was in this, I had to go in the SIG debt first. Every combo guy, at least in that battalion, had to go through this uh, signal detachment first, which is basically, you know, rear rear detachment like you're not on the team yet you're not you're not you know if you're deployed you're not going to be on a 12-man a team um right away may take just a few weeks may take a few months just kind of depends and uh so i was over there um in the sig debt and had an opportunity uh to uh try out for a, a different unit and i did it i went out to their selection um, I was in really good physical condition at the time and I was in good mental condition as far as self-belief and all that, but I just did not have the experience I needed. Uh, I passed the selection and went out through the training course there and it just was, uh, um, something that you, there's certain experiences that you just can't 
learn. You, know, you can't read, you know, you can't study in a book or in a schoolhouse. You need to go deploy. Um, at least that's what I needed. So uh, with that, I was sent to a, a different special forces team in Colorado Springs out of Fort Carson, and they were set to deploy to Iraq uh, very soon, just in a couple of months. So I uh, ended up working out great because I got some incredible training at this other uh, unit that I worked at that we won't get into the details on. <laughs> um, but uh, it taught me a lot and it taught me and it humbled me a lot too. I'm just like, Hey, just because you're in good shape and you've got some, uh, you know, grit, you can't just like, you, you can't just, uh, effort your way through everything, you know, like you, you definitely need to, you need to learn and you need to, um, I'm not going to say hold back. That's not the right word, but just kind of assess things in a different way. And, and, uh, um, let those experiences kind of come to you. Hmm. And it ended and up being perfect. I was on a great team over there and we went to Iraq. I was in, it was intense special forces group out of Carson. Um, and that's where I spent the rest of my time on active duty. And after you've gone through something like that and say, how many years did you actually uh, serve? Nate? So I served a total of about 10 years, 10 years. Um, so yeah. 10 the years. first, the first half of that was on active duty. The second half in the, uh, in the Texas National Guard while I was in college uh, playing football. So after that kind of service, um, not really thinking about the military career exactly right out of school, do right. you come back home with a different appreciation for the men and women who do serve? And do you see that freedom in a different set of eyes? Because now that you know freedom is not free and that there's lots of sacrifice behind it. So does it change your perspective on the um, fortune that we as Americans have, which is our freedom. Yeah, definitely. I mean, every time you go overseas to a new place, you, you gain a different perspective, you know, especially with around the different cultures and customs and all of that. And uh, yeah, that was a, that was another, another different one. I mean, when I was in, when I was in Darfur, there was, um, that was, a, there was, you know, some Islamic culture and all that stuff. Um, but it's still different country by country, region by region. So even Iraq and Afghanistan are very different. Um, and, and yeah, like, you know, being over there, um, that's one of the, the main things I kind of picked up on, uh, and have helped me a lot. I think in my life moving forward was, um, was just listening to those people's backgrounds and stories and like why they believe the way that they believe and um even if there's language barriers you can still we still as human beings kind of can, can communicate in certain ways and we all you know we often laugh at the same stuff and struggle with the same stuff and you know we get embarrassed all those like kind of youthful emotions that every child feels like every adult also has those and across different cultures those are a lot more relatable um because you can see it on somebody's face and feel the energy you know when they're um when they're uh, persevering or whatever that is and so that kind of stuff's really interesting and cool I, I love that um that was the best way to getting to know people and it was just to, by training with them you know go we're both going through uh training together and honestly going to war together um you, you become very close to people even if you can't speak two words <laughs> of, of, of each other's language. You know what I mean? One of the things I found really interesting, so you never played a down of, of organized football and you walked up to the University of, of Texas. Take me through that. Because all the fathers who are paying thousands of dollars to put their kids in camp every week in New York City. <laughs> There's value in that. Oh, no. There's definitely value in, in the camps too. I mean, um, <laughs> You know, I was just on a different camp. I was on, uh, you know, <laughs> I was on uh, Camp David, Camp Tarlovsky in Iraq. Um, yeah, the uh, so I was I was a good amount of the way through my that deployment in Iraq. End of two thousand eight. It's the fall. Football's on, and I'm kind of working through the grind of this deployment. And football was like my escape. I was watching every game that was on Armed Forces Network, football, or sorry, college football, pro football, didn't matter. I was just, I would watch it if I could. Uh, 
We get back from a deployment sometimes at 5 a.m. Or excuse me, get back from a mission at 5 a.m. And, you know, you've been out all night and Monday night football's on because yeah. we're not hours ahead. So yeah. I go into the man cave and watch Monday night football till I fall asloop. You know what I mean? Because uh, I just needed, I, want, I, I love the, I love the game, but also it was uh, this escape for me. And I just remember thinking about it, like how much I regretted not playing growing up because it was my favorite sport. And I played baseball and basketball and soccer and, you know, did these other things, but it still like just kind of bothered me that I just didn't do it. And I was like, man, you know what? When I get out of here, I'm going to go to college and, and I'm going to try and play football. Uh, I'm just going to walk, just try out, see what happens. You know what I mean? And initially, so is this a Spielberg movie or is this your real life? Come on, like who says that? <laughs> Think that they're going to yeah. walk well, on to I, the I, I one MVP without playing? <laughs> yeah, sure you are, Nate. Sure you're going to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I just figured. I mean, speaking of great movies, it's, it's uh, you know, Forrest Gump. Um, <laughs> it's one of my heroes, man. You know, and he, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the world. Uh, you just gotta. You just got to have some passion and some heart and go for it, you know, uh, and people, people respond to that. And I mean, you respond to yourself when you do that, you know, when you put yourself out there and go for it, that's the most like alive I I feel is when I'm trying to do something, I'm not quite sure I can complete it, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm passionate about it and I'm learning this new thing. And, you know, I, I just get, I'm excited. It gets me up in the morning. So yeah, I started you know, I was running routes and trying to learn how to backpedal over there when I had uh, free time. Come back to the States. My my good buddy, Brad uh, Keys, who, who unfortunately passed away in 2012. Um, this is in 09. I remember having this conversation with him in Iraq. We're up on the rooftop one night, sitting around a fire pit. And, you know, I'm telling him that uh, kind of in confidence <laughs> that I'm going to I'm going to go try and play college ball. And uh and I, you know, I remember telling him, like, you know, yeah, I'll probably, I'll pro I mean, since I didn't play before, I'll probably go to a, try to go to a small school or a JUCO or something like that, somewhere I think I can maybe make it. And Brad was like, no, nah, man, if you go, you got to go to a big school. You got to, you got to go for it, man. You're a Green Beret. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, fine. And I, I chose Texas because I saw that Longhorn logo everywhere out there. And there's a lot of people from Texas that join the Army, um, which makes sense. There's a lot of Army bases out there, too. Uh, but yeah, I was like, you know what? You're right. Why not? Like, if I don't make it, fine. The world keeps spinning. It's all good. Uh, so I got into UT and uh, when I went out to tryouts. And I, because I was in good, um, you know, condition, like uh, I had endurance and you know, I definitely wasn't going to quit. They, they saw the value in that as far as being a part of the scout team. Because it's like, well, we need guys that have no problem getting run over day in and day out. Rudy. And just bouncing up yeah exactly <laughs> so they put me on the scout team um i got to dress for home games you know and lead the team out of the tunnel with the american flag for the home games that first year and then my second year i got to run down on kickoff uh in one game on it was actually on veterans day and uh so i started and that's the year i started long snapping my sophomore year i was like man i gotta find a way on the field so i started long snapping i uh, ended up eventually winning the starting job and uh it's a long snap is just such a thankless skill. You know, you, you, uh, you do it right 500 times. Nobody cares. You screwed up once and like, you're the bad guy forever. <laughs> so that suited me <laughs> and you don't have to be the best athlete in the world. You just have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I started long snapping. I won the job and, and my last three years at Texas, uh, I was a starting long snapper, uh, while I was still in the guard. So another little tidbit there is, in the summer times, I would go overseas. So I went to I went to Greece one year, Bulgaria another year, um, and then my last two years before my junior senior year, I went to uh, Afghanistan for like a hundred and eight day deployment. Um, so we we'd leave, uh, which isn't that long. I mean, compared to some deployments, it's like three and a half months. Uh, we'd uh, we'd leave. I'd leave in uh, in April. Uh, we take our. Uh, they let me take my finals early at UT and I would leave in April. Then I'd come back first week in August in time for a uh, training camp, you know, for the next football season. And uh, it was cool. I mean, I, 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 I volunteered. I wanted to do it. Um, 
I, I just loved, I love deploying and I love being part of that and having that mission as well. And I love being, I love the, the tempo of, <laughs> and the juxtaposition of going back and forth, doing these two different things. Um, it just suited me. Uh, and but yeah, so that's, that, that was kind of my college experience. Green and so how working. did you end up being um, drafted or <laughs> getting an opportunity with the NFL team? Yeah. So I, I, I graduated and I got invited to play in the senior all-star game in Charleston. It's called the Medal of Honor Bowl. They don't even have it anymore. I think it was just around for two or three years. And it was hosted by the Medal of Honor Society. And um, they asked me to be the long snapper for one of the teams. So I go out there to the practices and there's a bunch of scouts and uh, former players, not former players, scouts and like uh, like personnel from other teams, you know, from NFL teams uh, at the practices. And I, I had meetings with like four different teams and they were like, look, you know, you're 34 years old. You're pretty small. You're new to the game, but you're a good long snapper. You should, you should, you should give it a shot. So I was like, all right, that's enough for me. So I came back, uh, came back to the States. I came back to the States, man, I'm all messed up. <laughs> came back to uh, Texas and um, um, was, you know, finishing up my degree, ended up doing an internship out in Los Angeles uh, with Peter Berg, who does, he, he made like Friday Night Lights and Lone Survivor. And, um, so that brought me out to LA because I wanted to learn about, I wanted to get back into this film dream. And simultaneously, I started uh, training with Jay Glazer at his gym, Unbreakable Performance Center in uh, West Hollywood. And he trains a lot of elite athletes, MMA fighters, football players. And then also a lot of celebrities go into his gym because it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's yeah. some of the, the best training you can get. And it's just like, kind of got this old school fight gym feel to it, but it's also, you know, it's the old building where the Roxbury was from like night at the Roxbury. So it's like, a, it's a really unique place. Um, and I met Jay. He really loved my story and just wanted to help me out. So he put me on scholarship there at the gym and, uh, it, you know, helped train me and it put some of his best people around me to work on all kinds of drills. And then I was practicing my long snapping when I could too. And I put on like 30 pounds wow. over the course of uh, four months. It wasn't all good weight, but <laughs> I just had to. Um, so I wouldn't get you know thrown around <laughs> with those big NFL cats. Draft rolls around. I don't get drafted, but I signed as a free agent with the uh, Seattle Seahawks. Um, the, the last day of the draft, the, the Seahawks and the, the Rams were still in St. Louis at the time. The Seahawks and the Rams called me and both offered me an undrafted uh, contract, uh, a free agent contract. And I chose to go to Seattle because they'd been to back-to-back -back Super Bowls and, you know, definitely a tougher team to make at the time, but I just couldn't turn down that challenge. You know, I was like, man, I just thought about Brad. Brad was passed away by then. And I just thought, what would he say? You know, are you going to go to the small school? You're going to go to the big one. So, um, so I chose Seattle and, it was great. I was up there for five months, OTAs, training camp, preseason, played in one preseason game against the Denver Broncos. Cool. Uh, and it was Peyton Manning's last year. So like I'm warming up before the game and Peyton Manning's at midfield throwing the ball. And I mean, the team was back then it was, it was Richard Sherman and um, legend of Brown, Boom. the legend Marshawn of Boom. Lynch. Marshawn Lynch locker was like two away from me. Oh, wow. uh, Russell <laughs> Wilson, Michael Bennett, Bobby Wagner, Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor, Doug Baldwin. I mean, a squad. I think, I think uh they were the legend of Tyler Blue. Lockett's like the only guy still on the team from back then, the, the receiver, because he was a rookie with me. So anyway, and I was, you know, I was a 34-year-old rookie, but I was also the oldest guy on the team, uh, which was pretty crazy. Jay Glazer, I went to Jay's first MMA fight in uh New York. I used to train with uh, the Jets offensive line jumbo elliott jason Fabini, and those guys and he was just getting started in his mma career back then he was really good friends with michael strahan yeah it is, still is their best you're, get, you're downplaying the skill level that you need to have in football i mean i don't know if people really understand like you had these giant guys in the gym who thought they could push around jumbo jumbo's first step was so quick that no matter how big a guy was, he was going flying that way. So you'd have a 300 body pound bodybuilder who thought he could play football, try to get in front of Jumbo, and Jumbo would just like, 
his first step is so quick. So I mean, these guys are they're so amazing. Elite, these athletes. But you must have been as well to be able, you know, even to make it that far. Honestly, I wasn't. I, I I was I worked really hard to be able to just stay on the field with them. But I mean, speed wise, power wise, I'd I'd never really had it. I mean, even in high school, like I was I was a six man on the basketball team. You know what I mean? I didn't even start. Um, my sophomore year, I got cut from the baseball team, had to work my way back to, to make it, uh, to make varsity the next year. And it, uh, you know, I, I just, I just worked really, really hard. And I found that, I mean, that long snapping, that was the only, that was the only shot I was going to have, uh, to, to have a legit chance, you know, in the NFL. And, um, but that's your story, Nate, that, and that's the show, uh, the story that all of us have, you know, that. Just because you get knocked down once doesn't mean that's the end of it because right. you get back up again. And maybe when you got knocked down, you learned a lot of great lessons. Yeah. And then you also find people like Jay who want to support you because they see where your heart's at. Right. But, but those guys didn't have what you have is you're a Green Beret. So <laughs> yeah. without the freedom that you have fought for, it doesn't matter how fast you're on that football field or how well you can throw. You have to be free right. to do those things. So I think there's a respect that they they must have had for you and the service that you've given to our country. So that's amazing. So I know you have to run soon, but could you just give us a quick update about your movie? You have a movie that's out yeah. right now? Yeah, and so, well, I mean, it wraps the story up nicely. So after the uh, after I, I got released from the Hawks, um, I went back to, came back to LA. I didn't know what I was gonna do. I'd lost, you know, I'd gotten out of the military in February. Now it's September. So I lost my camouflage in February. In that locker room, I lost my jersey in September in that locker room. And Jay noticed in me um, that, you know, I needed to figure some stuff out. And I, I was considering maybe I'm going to just reenlist. I don't know what I'm going to do. And Jay was like, no, no, no. There's a million guys in your shoes right now feeling the same way that you do, veterans and athletes. Because I talk to these athletes all the time. And I know you talk to these vets that yeah. are struggling with that transition. Let's start an organization that brings together these combat vets and these former professional athletes. That organization is called MVP, which stands for Merging Vets and Players. And about three years after we started operating into 2015, we'd already, at that time, we were, we expanded. We were in uh, Los Angeles, um, Las Vegas, Chicago, and Atlanta. Um, and now we have four more chapters uh, today in New York, Seattle, Dallas, and Phoenix. But back then in 2018, we had four chapters. We're growing. And a, a British veteran buddy of mine had come into MVP and he wanted to get lunch with me and kind of pick my brain. And he asked me how this all start. And I told him about this conversation I had with Jay, but I said, well, how it really started, what we do in the gym every week and huddling up and kind of training together and then talking through our, our challenges that started from this Marine that was living in a homeless shelter down on sunset Boulevard. And he got some of his buddies together. I had met him, you know, down there. He brought, he started bringing them up to the gym. Jay started bringing in these uh, former athletes. And when I talk about former athletes, it's like Randy Couture and Tony Gonzalez kind of athletes. <laughs> and these guys are all sharing their stories and kind of, you know, going through a lot of the same things. And my buddy was like, dude, that's a movie. Like, let's, let's write it. Let's write a movie about that. Let's make a movie. I know you're into filmmaking and you want to do this. Like, let's, let's, let's try so we did. We started writing it um, back then in 2018. Um, about a year later, got a script to a place we felt was, you know, decent. Started sharing it. Uh, Sylvester Stallone had come to MVP before through Jay and was really blown away by what we were doing. So I figured I sent it to his production company and his producing partner. Uh, I've had a good relationship with for a long time. And, he, you know, he gave me a ton of notes, but was like, hey, I think you have something here. And I want to, we want to support you. So Sylvester Stallone lent his name to it. Um, and then when COVID hit, we just kind of went into high gear and said, let's just move, let's make this thing, you know? And so it's all, almost all veterans and athletes on the cast and crew. Every veteran portrayed on screen is played by a vet. All those, a lot of those athletes like Tony Gonzalez, Randy Couture, Strahan, Howie Long, Jay Glazer, uh, Jared Bunch, these real athletes playing themselves in the movie. And then some really cool cameos from like Tom Arnold and, Dan Loria, who is the dad on the Wonder Years, he, he's a Vietnam vet. He's in the film. Um, mm -hmm. And we just made it happen. And, you know, 
So Mo McRae, who plays Will Phillips, unbelievable performance. He's he's unreal. He brought in these actresses, uh, Christina Ochoa and Dina Shahabi, who have like just kind of jumped off the screen. And since then, like the, they're like series regulars on these big shows, you know. So we have this incredible cast and project, and we just made it happen. We didn't have much money wise, but we just figured it out. And and now, you know, Veterans Day, it's out. It's available everywhere uh people can watch it through amazon prime apple tv uh, other streaming services and uh so go see it go see go see that's the best way to learn about mvp right now you know beyond going to our website vetsandplayers.org to to kind of see what we do but if you want to really experience what that world is like for a lot of us you know go see the movie really encourage you to do oh, I that i can't see it on my phone let's get a show well, too. Nate, <laughs> that's awesome before we let you go there's one more story we wanted to ask you about so Lots of folks probably don't know, but you are the guy who who kind of uh, guided Colin Kaepernick to the position that he came up with of taking a knee. So can you explain in your brief words about how you met Colin, the, the conversations you had with him, and, and how did you um, get to the point to where he took the knee, and um, are you still in touch with him? Uh, you know, I haven't talked to Colin for, for quite some time. Um, I know he's working on a, I think he's working on a documentary project with Spike Lee right now um, about his story, you know, kind of in his, uh, in his own words. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't asked me to be a part of that, so I'm not sure <laughs> um, what all they're going to cover and, and all that stuff. But, um, you know, my brief encounters with Cap were, were very positive. Like I, I met him in 2016, you know, he was sitting on the bench uh, during the anthem and I'd written this open letter Um sort of encouraging him just to consider another perspective, but also empowering him and, and letting him know that I respect what he was doing. And, you know, I thought it took a lot of courage and, um, you know, he was exercising his first amendment rights, something that I fought for. You know, we all fought for in the military, whether you like it or not, we took the oath to defend that. And he ended up reaching out to me. He said he was inspired by my open letter and through our conversations, uh, he ended up, uh, taking a knee alongside his teammates instead of sitting on the bench. And I thought that was pretty powerful. And, and uh, you know, I, I said a lot about him, his willingness to kind of be flexible and um, open and try to adjust uh, to, to, cause he didn't want to offend people in the, in the military and it still offended a lot of people. And that's their prerogative, you know, that's their, the way they perceive it. But uh, I was, I was, I was proud to stand next to him uh, the first night he did it at a, uh, at a game and um you know I always thought people take a knee to pray and propose and uh when a player on the hurt on the field is hurt the other players take a knee out of respect so I, I you know I thought it was a good adjustment um but yeah yeah I haven't talked to him in quite some time but he's uh you know unfortunately hasn't been able to get back in, in the league and I think that's something that he's really wanted to do over the last several years and I think he's still trying I'm not exactly sure but um, kind of kind of kind of seems like he, he is thank you so much i know we i know you have to jump on a call but thank you so much for taking the time wow, thank you guys I really yeah, appreciate it. and like i said you're part of the uh, muslim fitness family yeah. now so we'll be back you know when you have things you need to release when you need to increase the awareness of the project uh the projects and the and the things you're involved in and the charities you got a home here so uh we look thank forward you, to seeing you sometime here in the dc area and uh sorry i couldn't catch up with you this time but i owe you coffee or lunch so look forward Next to seeing time, you brother. soon <laughs> all right all right, thank How you. How are you doing, y'all? Take care. Sure. All right.